I want to tell you about a simple and beautiful idea that made my life better. And by the end of this talk, you may just conclude that uh, you, you may uh, share my enjoyment of this simple and beautiful idea, or you may just think uh, that time is a little weird and needs to get out a bit more. Um, but at all events, I hope that you'll be able to follow as we go along, because I'm going to show you quite a lot of code. And it would be more fun for me if you would, uh, you would kind of respond as we go, kind of ask questions as we go, where, right, we can do, we're allowed to do that, yes. And in particular, if I show you a single line of code that you don't understand, then tell me, because it will be no fun if, you, if I show you lots of code and you don't understand any of it, will it? <laughs> so, here's the context. Um, so, uh, Haskell, which is the, my, you know, my, 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 my um, first child, really, uh, my uh, son was born in 1990, and Haskell was really born in about 1989. Um, Haskell's a very big functional programming language. It has a lot of surface language features. So, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, quantified into an algebraic data type that describes the syntax, there are lots of constructors. Um, so, and then we um, de-sugar the whole thing down into something very small. So the, the whole surface language is type-checked and then de-sugared into a very small intermediate language. So this we call core, and it really is very small. It's basically just the lambda calculus. Um, and uh, so all of this really rather big functional language is squidged down into this little core language. And the story that I want to tell you today is about a recent change uh, that we made just to the core language. So because, so you may not be that interested in this, but I'm hopeful that you might be a bit more interested in this because, after all, we're all inside all of these, you know, high-performance numerical data processing applications with GPUs. There's little functional languages hiding, right? And this is just a little functional language that might be useful to you. Okay, that's the scene. Here's the um, here's what core looks like. So here's Haskell as a surface language. Um, so this is uh, what uh, a function that negates a boolean, and this is a, a function that tests whether a list is empty, null, and it, there's pattern matching on the left and type signatures and so forth. By the time it's turned into core, it's just a simple lambda calculus language. So here's null, every binder is explicitly type annotated, and uh, it's, so this backslash is just a lambda, so it says I'm a function of x, and I then case expressions, I'm gonna use a lot in this talk, so pay attention now if you've never seen a case expression before. This is just like an if, really. It just says scrutinize x if it's empty, return true. If it's a cons, return false. And Booleans are just more things that are scrutinized by case expressions up here. Does that make sense so far? Okay. No assignments, though. Uh, so the story of this talk is um, really a, a sort of resolution of a long-term guilt trip. So uh, you may have uh, heard about this book by Andrew Appel. Right? Very famous book about compilation technology for functional languages. And it basically said, guys, you should use continuation parsing style inside your compiler. So CPS is a sort of clever, but it turns out quite tricky way to express your compiler. It's very much in the spirit of lambda, the ultimate go-to, lambda, the ultimate everything. So I love this, but I always felt guilty about it because GHC, my compiler for Haskell, didn't use CPS. So I was very relieved when Cormac Flanagan and his, his friends said, actually, you don't need CPS. You can compile in direct style, which is the style of programming. I should be showing you, and not lose anything. But then, Andrew Kennedy and his friends came along and said, ah, oh, but you still do lose some things. So I was back to feeling guilty again. So um, our compiler, however, for, for you know, the, the whole of its history, used um, CPS. So this paper, this, this, this talk, explains how to actually get all the juice of CPS, I claim, but this is an open challenge to everybody, to in a very, very simple, elegant way that gets the goodness of CPS without the pain. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Right? Goodness without pain? Yes. All right. Um, so this is not just a little trick about compilation technology. It also has quite deep intellectual roots, uh, deeper than, uh, than I fully understand. So um, the lambda calculus is a textual language that, um, uh, that is very tightly linked to a proof technique called natural deduction. So you can think of lambda calculus term as encoding a proof in the, a form of logic called natural deduction. But natural deduction is not the only form of logic. Sequent logic is another. So just as lambda calculus is intimately connected by the curry howard isomorphism to, um, to uh, uh, natural deduction, so sequent calculus is very closely connected to sequent logic. And you might ask, as Zina Ariola here at the University of Oregon did ask me, in a kind of challenging kind of way, maybe the sequent calculus would be a better basis for a compiler intermediate language than was the lambda calculus. So Zina is a very clever person, so I took her seriously, and with her students we studied this quite a lot, and ended up with something that was a bit complicated, but 
what, the, what this talk is about. I'm, going to not going to, I'm not going to lead you down the toilsome route that we followed here. I'm just going to take you to the answer, right? The easy way to do it without having to drag you through the hard ways to do it. But I just want to reassure you there is, there is, that, that everything here is, has actually some quite deep, deep roots in, in logic, even. OK, so how are we doing? Four minutes in. Yes. OK, so here is this, the, the basic setup for the problem I want to tackle. Here is a function that you might write in your source program. Uh, not null of x's is not of null of x's, where not and null are defined just as I showed you them before. How's the optimizer going to deal with this? Well, imagine that we first of all inline not, so not's written in black. So this code, this black code here, is just the result of inlining not as its call site. All right? Does, does that make sense? So this is a very important step. Take, take this not here. Just inline the code, there's the true and the false, and, there, and you, instead of B, I write the scrutiny here, the argument of the function. So far, so good? Okay. So now I'm going to inline null as well. So that's the bit in the red. So I've just replaced null x's by its right-hand side, simply instantiating the body. That's all we do in functional language compilers is replace calls with their right-hand sides. Okay. Now what? Now, now what can we do? Um, because this code isn't terribly efficient compared to what we'd hope to do. The test for not null is not very hard to do, right? You know what? There's clearly not very good code is going to come out if we stop here. So what should we do? We should? Optimize. Optimize. How? <laughs> we want to take this outer case here, this black case. This black guy on the outside, he's the crocodile, right? So he's eating something. And the thing he's eating is the results of this inner case. So if we could duplicate the crocodile into the two branches, we'd be good, right? So here is the black crocodile. I've just duplicated him into both branches, because after all, he's consuming the result of both branches. And now, it's pretty, you know, case true of true or false, that's pretty easy to optimize. This one's pretty easy to optimize, and I get this, which is, of the course, the code that you would like to get out of not null. That's the code you would have written in the first place, okay? So the, the key step here is what's called this commuting conversion. This step from here to here, in which I move an outer case into the branches of an inner case. This works equally for conditionals, for if then else's. All good compilers do commuting conversions. OK? Oh, um, oh beg your pardon? Oh, if you've got side effects, all bets are off, right? All good compilers do commuting conversions when they can be sure there are no side effects. So GHC, I'm lucky because I know there aren't going to be. You, you see compiler guys, you have to worry about that. So do a lot of worrying, yes. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Because I'm changing the order of things, and so side effects, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. OK. You might worry uh, just that the, there might be a little problem here, because if I take this outer crocodile, if this black guy, the crocodile, has some big expressions, right, big right-hand sides here, you know, thousands of lines of code, then if I simply duplicate it in these two right-hand sides, what's going to happen? Lots of duplicated code. Not so good. Naughty compiler. Right? So what do we have to do about that? Just share them. And you can share them by simply giving them names. So, we, so this little core language, as, as every little um, intermediate language does, has a form of uh, binding, of local bindings, just binding local variables, in this case called J1 and J2. So they're just functions whose right-hand side are these big things. And now the bit that I can duplicate is small. OK? So that's dealing with the code duplication worry. Now, of course, once I've collapsed these, I might hope that there's only one call to J, and I can inline, inline it back in. Um, and in fact, that's what happens in this particular case, because I'm going to end up having simplified these two right-hand sides to something which just calls J1 once and J2 once. So now I can treat them as ordinary functions in inline, right, and get the original code that I had. So um, even if they're big, I want to get that. But if they happen to be used for more than one place, then I would not want to inline them. I just want to share them. OK? All right. So nothing new so far, just commuting conversions, as has been done inside most compilers for a long time. Let me just make a quick diversion to remark this: all of this works equally well if the patterns bind variables. So here's, in this top case, there's this branch binds a variable, x. Do you remember you saw that in the, um, in that, in the earlier things we had pattern matching on lists? We bind the, the head and the tail of the list. Here, this is another kind of pattern in which I'm binding um, a variable x. So this expression, big one, might mention x. How can I share that? Oh, well, it's easy. I just make x a parameter of big one, no, of j1, but big one. That's pretty easy, right? So it scales nicely. OK. So now these j guys are special, right? If I was to really, supposing one really was shared and could not be inlined away in the end, if one really was shared, it was, it was called from many places, then 
I still wouldn't want to um, do what you might naturally think for a let binding, which would be to allocate, heap allocate some structure and pass it along. No, it's really just a label. These chaps are really just labels. What do they mean? Go to J1 carrying the parameter X. So if, you like, if I could imagine drawing the control flow of this thing, what have I first got to do? Scrutinize X's here. In the nil case, I've got to scrutinize E1. In the cons case, I've got to scrutinize E2 here. Um, and then uh, I've got to call either J1 or J2 depending. Does that make sense? So it, it's really a control flow operator. These extra let bindings are control flow kind of things. They're, so that's why I call them join points, because they're places where um, execution comes together. And, um, uh, and so calling a join point like these guys, these calls here, that should be no, matter, no more than adjust the stack pointer and go to. Right, so this is, we're trying to reflect in this intermediate language the operational reality that these things are just going to be go-to'd. And to, or, all good compilers do this too, right? For they have some kind of, usually it just in the back end, they recognize these very special kind of bindings and implement them more efficiently. And that's what GHT has done for many years. How is that related to phi nodes? It's actually very similar to phi nodes. Yes, thank you for that. So these join points are just like, so you might, in a phi notator, in SSA notation, you'd write phi of, you know, A, B here. And I'm modeling that by passing a parameter here. So, I, so this here is, I'm abstracting over the things that might come, might be differently bound in different source places. So it's exactly phi nodes all over again. Um, and indeed, Andrew Pell wrote a famous paper called um, um, uh, CPS is SSA or something of that, that form in which he pretty much drew the connection between these little lambda languages and, and um, SSA form. Thanks. Anyone else at this point? No. Okay, I'm about to get to the excitement. Uh, <laughs> exciting though this has doubtless been. Um, so I just, before I get there, I just want to characterize what is it that makes these, the, joint, the let bindings that are join points that have this very fast operational implementation, what makes it different what makes them different from ordinary old let bindings? And here it is. Uh, so one of these green join point things is a join point that has this very efficient implementation. If all, its, all the calls to it are tail calls, right? that is you know, done in the SQL here, no call is captured in a thunk or closure. Right? So there's no, it can't escape, if you like. Um, and moreover, every call is saturated. So it has exactly the right number of arguments, and um, it cannot be sort of captured and, and escape its scope. Okay? Not just escape its code. It can't be passed as an argument for something else, for example. You can see all its calls, and they are all tail calls. That's its properties. And once you've done this, then you can really optimize the, 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 back, end, the back end stuff very nicely. So, so far, now we have got to the point at which GHC was, you know, three years ago. And it worked quite nicely, but there is a nasty problem, and here it is. Um, it's possible to take something, that, a program that had a join point, and sort of lose the join point. And here is a nice small example. Here is a case, the black crocodile, consuming this little sort of red victim here. And the little red victim itself has a join point in it. So somehow, there's only one call here, so you might think it'd be inlined away. But imagine that there were, there were several. Um, so I'm not going to inline this J away. So here we are. This is a join point, efficiently implemented. Um, and this guy is scrutinizing him. Now, what you might think was that if we move the black crocodile inside the, you know, that, that scrutiny, this J would sort of come out to the outside here, and we'd end up scrutinizing um, X's and move the black crocodile right inside to scrutinize um, what J1 and E2, J, J of X and E2, right? That would be the, the natural way of implementing this, uh, just the outer case moves in around the branches of an inner case. But look what has happened here. Now, J is no longer a join point. It isn't tail called anymore. So we don't have access to that efficient implementation. And even worse, the, uh, this case here, this guy, is not scrutinizing. He's scrutinizing JX, which is not very informative. What he really wanted to scrutinize was E1. But E1 might have, you know, constructors that might cancel with the case. Do you remember that was the whole point of moving the outer case inwards, is he might now meet something he could eat, you know, like a data constructor with, who we wouldn't have to do the case anymore. And now, look, he's just scrutinizing something boring. We really want him to see that. You see the problem? This is the moment at which if you, you know, if you don't see a problem at the moment, then you'll not have much fun in the rest of the talk. Um, In this case, oh, E1 might mention X. 
indeed. Yes, E1 might mention X because, after all, J is you know, just a function that's abstracted over X. So it's just a parameter. To, so E1 might mention X, that it's bound there, and it may be passed. Oh, beg, maybe I should have used a different name, and the point is it's, it's carried here, passed to J, which uses it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. But the problem is the step from here to here, which is doing something that's usually good, has actually done bad things to J. And I hate it when my compiler is saying, oh, if I did this thing, you know, something gets better and something else gets worse. And it's very difficult to make optimization work well under those circumstances. So what would we like to do? Just think about it intuitively. We want this outer black crocodile. What is he going to scrutinize? He's gonna, he might be consuming this E2 guy. But in the end, this inner case expression is going to return E1 or E2. So we want the black crocodile to consume E1 or E2. So what we want is this, right? We want to move the black crocodile around the right-hand side of this uh, J binding, right? And around the E2, but not here. This is the, this is the, the moment. This is, if you remember nothing else, remember this, this slide, right? The, we've got this, this uh, so I'm going to now distinguish these join points, which I previously said were just kind of special lets. I'm going to give them a special name, join, right? I know that they are join points. And now, when the outer case comes around and tries to consume a join point binding, as it does here, the outer case is going to duplicate itself into the right-hand side of the join binding because that is one of the exit paths of this entire expression. You could try to look happy at this point. <laughs> <laughs> this is... The, you know, at the moment, it kind of looks like a hack. I just tell you, I, I know it all works because it fits up with this logic stuff, but it's really nice that you, we're just going to, we're doing something a bit funny here. This outer, outer crocodile sort of vanishes here, but reappears here. As if he's sort of gone, you know, he started going around the J, and then he popped up to here. Okay? And now, look, two, two good things have happened. First is that J is still a join point, and the second is that the black crocodile is now consuming... E1, which is what we wanted, because E1 has the, you know, the hapless uh, victims that we want him to eat. Okay? And that's it. That's really the idea. Um, we want to dignify join points specially, um, formalize them as a language construct, and then have slightly different language transformation rules for optimizing them. And that one simple idea is enough to make a quite significant difference to the optimization story. So here it is in, uh, in symbols. I'm not going to um, hesitate here just to say this is GHC's core language. You know, variables, literals, lambdas, applications, big lambdas and type applications, constructors, case expressions, let bindings. All we're going to do is to add join bindings, very light let bindings, and this jump thing. So here... Um, I'm going to dignify this, the, the, the join points I'm going to dignify specially, and I'm going to also dignify their calls specially as, we'll call it, a jump here. And that's really all. So there's very little additional clutter. Now we really have baked in. Now we really have baked in SSA. SSA, yes, exactly. So this is all just, I mean, you can, you can look at it through SSA spectacles and say that's all it is. Um, and you... Yes, no, I think it really is. It really is saying that one of these join points is precisely one of those phi nodes. Yes. Yep, you, it's exactly that. Yes, I think it would be good to do a more, now we've sort of, it's rather like those things, all good ideas in computer science amount to, you know, having a long journey and coming back to a place very near to where you started and recognizing it for the first time. Um, and so I think it would be quite interesting to look at all the transformations we are now doing with join points and reinterpreting them in SSA style with fine notes and saying, have those guys missed anything? And, and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing fundamentally new here. It's just it's in this sort of calculus-y world. It's significant, a significant jump. Yeah. I mean, in retrospect, it's embarrassing it took us so long to do it. It's interesting that Toby has chosen to come back to the Yeah. Of course, you went back to CPS, did you say? Well, of course, you know, These join points are just continuations as well, yes. It's sort of continuation passing style in a very, very limited and stylized way that does just enough. Yeah. Two minutes, is that right? Or yeah, we got a little more? About two. Okay, right. So now we have to go into video mode. Uh, what does the compiler do? We're going to, this is not going to be a surface language construct. It's just a compiler internal. So the compiler infers join points um, and exploits them in its commuting conversion code and then infers um, 
uh, and fig figures out uh, which let bindings, which let bindings from the user's program or that arise through optimization are in fact join points, and it turns them into join points and keeps them that way. Um, okay, so, and then, then there's some, the, uh, uh, it's very easy to encode the new optimization rules. They're very simple modifications of one we have already. Um, I do want to make one, one remark. This is another thing that might be interesting to explore in the SSA world again. Joins can be recursive, right? So they're, uh, lets can be recursive, local bindings can be recursive, and so can join. So here's a join rec, which has two parameters. It does some case analysis, and then it does a jump to, well, itself. Uh, is that right? Yes, this LJ thing, right? It can be called from outside. So this is then turning a recursive function into one with a local joint, local recursive join point is very like, uh, you know, a standard turning tail, recurs tail, turning tail recursion into a loop. Very standard transformation. I'm going to um, um, ignore this and just say uh, this worked out uh, very well from an implementation point of view. It was a very non-invasive transformation of GHC. So that was very, that's very nice. I've, you know, I come to the conclusion that just everybody who implements a compiler of this kind should just do it. Um, I, I can't say that it gives us a lot of performance in and of itself. Right, look, here's, the, here's a big benchmark sheet that GHC says. Some, some um, programs' performance do really well, but mostly the geometric mean improvement in performance is extremely minor. Um, so mostly this is a sort of, I regard this as a kind of cleanup of the compiler and one that makes optimization more robust, less fragile to minor changes in the source program. Um, but it may affect programming style. So my last little piece is just to say, just to show you very briefly an unexpected bonus that was totally came out of the uh, clear blue sky. Uh, and I'm going to uh, just skip to this slide to show it to you. Here is, a, um, here is a recursive loop, right? One of these join work things. It's a little loop, and it runs around and around and does something, and the result of the loop is consumed by something. All right? Now, um, if we just move, use the rules that we've already explained that says, well, we move the outer case into the right-hand side of the join, then we find that we end up with that case blah, the red case, sorry, the crocodile has turned red. He ends up around the done and around the yield, which might be good because he might be scrutinizing constructors, and, and he evaporates here. So it turns out not only that join points can move not only into the right-hand sides of non-recursive things, but right into effectively the exit paths of the loop. And that turns out to be very beneficial. And actually, uh, once you tell programmers that this can happen, they then can change their programming style because you get a kind of fusion um, operation over the uh, fusion of loops that really just didn't happen before at all. No, that was very nice. Um, so this is my, uh, my final slide, really. I think if you're implementing, and, and all of you are, I suspect some of you have got little functional languages inside your compiler space. If you're implementing um, you know, a, uh, a direct style, you know, Lambda-ish compiler, you should consider using join points in your intermediate language. Um, and I think for the uh, CPS uh, folk among us, I, I, this is my open challenge. Are there any remaining reasons to use CPS? Guys, tell you tell me. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat>